Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. So our topic today is how to ensure Mac compliance with Microsoft Intune and Jamf Pro. As Nick said, I'm Joe Bloom. I'm the product manager for Jamf Pro, formerly known as the Casper Suite. And here's our agenda for today. I'll give a very brief overview of Jamf. I do want to talk about establishing a trusted identity because that is at the heart of what we're trying to do in ensuring Mac compliance with Microsoft Intune and Jamf. It's that pairing of a user identity and device trust. I'll walk through some use cases, just different scenarios to be aware of, uh, really with respect to the types of users of devices and the types of devices. Then I'll go into how Jamf specifically addresses these problems, and that's where we'll dive into the Microsoft Intune and Jamf Pro integration, and we'll follow up with some next steps in Q&A. So first off, just a brief overview of Jamf. Our mission is to help organizations succeed with Apple. We see Apple as being at the forefront of ensuring security and an end user experience that we want to be a part of. And so throughout the history of Jamf, we've positioned ourselves as a management framework for allowing users to get the most out of their Apple experience. To that aim, we have two products, Jamf Now and Jamf Pro, that are geared toward helping you with Apple device management. Jamf Now is our simple mobile device management solution, really geared toward small to medium-sized businesses. And then there's Jamf Pro, which is really for IT professionals. It's to enforce a number of the really robust security types of features that you want in your environment. Very quickly here, these are a side-by-side -side of those two products. Jamf Now, again, very easy setup, some simple management commands. Security without complexity is really the way that we view that. So the basics of security, like wiping a device. On the Jamf Pro side, of course, we specialize in many more things around device configuration, deploying applications, collecting inventory so that you understand exactly what that device looks like and it can assess the risk of that device, security controls, and then we also have our self-service app. And that self-service app is what allows the end user to do things themselves and take some of the burden away from, from IT in supporting those people. So putting things into their hands like installing printers, uh, installing additional software applications, and maybe even putting in links to help desk tools should they need support, or references, uh, links to human resources documentation and other things that will make them effective within your organization. Jamf Pro is currently used now uh, by over 13,000 organizations. We have over 9 million devices under management. And we have a lot of uh, different industries where we are very commonly found. Um, of course, education. So for those who are in the education space, uh, we do have a number of education customers. But then we're also very common in the enterprise as well. Going back to that idea of helping organizations succeed with Apple, we do that by focusing on compatibility and full functionality on the day of an Apple release or before that release. So we really strive not just for compatibility so that all of your existing workflows will continue after an operating system comes out, but also unlocking some of the key functionality, things like lost mode. When lost mode came out, we knew that we needed to deliver that either before or on the day that it was available as an operating system update so that if a device was lost, you could put it into lost mode, understand where it was located. And that's the type of new functionality that we know is core to what people want to do. And as part of Jamf's mission, we strive to ensure zero-day support for those kinds of updates. That leads me into the topic for today, which is really around trusted identity. So we'll talk specifically about Mac compliance but I think it's important to understand what a trusted identity means today as more things are going into the cloud. I really see this as three parts, and this is what we'll focus on. There is the user, there's the network, and there's the device. This is very important because it's not just the user authenticating and saying that they are who they are. It's also about the network and the traffic and what that means from a security standpoint and understanding how they're getting access to that information. What's the channel look like? And then lastly is the device, not just the user having authentication, but understanding that device and trusting that device because that device also has access to resources that are important to your organization. Very quick story around that point. 
when I was staying at a guest house, there was a computer. It was a shared computer for people who were staying there, and you could use it during the duration of your stay. And I noticed that it was prompting to save usernames and passwords as you were browsing to different sites. And being a, the good person that I am, I went in to check that out, and I deleted all of that information for anybody who had been staying there and accidentally stored their information on that computer. Very important because that was a device that was accessing information and it was not blocking that information as long as the user could authenticate. And the user, in some cases, was probably unknowingly exposing themselves to risk and potentially their organization to risk. So I'll dive in a little bit more into the user. I, and these are just common ways I want to point out that you can enforce additional security around the user. So as, as far as compliance goes and this trusted identity, how do you establish that? Well, traditionally, we relied on username and password. And the ways of making that secure were making secure complex passwords, password reuse policies, and the frequency in which you have to update those. And that's good, but as more things go to the cloud, you need to leverage more than just the user authentication because now you have information that is exposed more publicly. That's where you start to see the multi-factor authentication and single sign-on applications come into play. These are all geared toward providing a positive user experience, things like single sign-on that give them a method to easily sign in, but then also additional factors of authentication should you need them, which are usually delivered by a passcode or some application. And of course, we start to see more biometrics coming into play as well. Lastly, I do want to touch on certificate or token-based authentication. Certificates, I think, are really nice because you can provide that to a user. It's often invisible to the user because you can install the certificate on the device and then allow them to use that to authenticate in without having to provide that username and password. But what's also good about that is it expires at a certain time that you can dictate, and you can revoke that so that if for some reason you see some kind of risk in your environment and believe that you are exposed, you can revoke that certificate and then prevent that from being used as an authentication method. So just some common user ways of ensuring trust of the identity. The next is network, and I'll just talk very briefly about network. There's network access control tools. Uh, those are looking for things like intrusion prevention and vulnerability assessments, nice ways of gating access to the network. And I'll talk a little bit later about how Jamf Pro leverages that, uh, understanding if a device is trusted, and then one place where you can block access is at the network level. The other is architecture and firewalls, so just understanding what traffic are you allowing in, what traffic is going out of your network, network to network and device to network communications, how do you leverage the demilitarized zone, all of these things that are kind of traditional in the network uh, security profile. And then of course there's proxying and rerouting traffic, leveraging things like VPNs to ensure that you have a more secure environment. So multiple ways of doing that, I'll touch on how Jamf addresses that in a little bit. And then last is device trust. Device trust is really the heart of what we're talking about with the Microsoft Intune and Jamf Pro integration. Understanding what that device looks like and then being able to take action on that. Now on the Jamf Pro side, we do a lot around management and configuration. There's a number of benchmarks, the CIS standards, for example. Uh, some people follow STIG. And you can enforce those on a device using Jamf Pro so that you can have assurance that the device is configured properly and meets whatever your security uh, risk assessment needs to be. There's some nuance to that and how you want to configure a device. So just to be you know, aware of things, there's corporate owned devices, belong to your organization. Some people have devices that they bring into your environment. So different concerns, different ways that you can deal with those. And then there's corporate owned and personally enabled devices, those being organizationally owned. But if you have that kind of relationship with people in your organization, you can acknowledge that they're going to use it for personal activities and say that that's OK. But also what's nice about that, uh, I would say as an individual, is it means that first and foremost, the organizational data is protected. It's on a managed device that's fully configured and secured. But then anything that I do personally on that device is also protected. So should I lose that device, my corporate identity and my personal identity are both protected. And we see that coming up more and more as a method for deploying devices. Last is compliance enforcement. So when a device is not in a state that is desired and it's fallen out of compliance, how do you remediate that? 
What does the workflow look like? And I'll show you some of the examples of what we did with Intune in the Microsoft conditional access workflows. So I want to talk briefly about use cases. I'll point out three scenarios of where is the user tied to the user identity, and I'll point out three scenarios of where is the device, what kind of device is it. So first off are users that are in the office, and this is fairly straightforward. They're in the office. They may have a mobile device, but they're primarily using it on site. Uh, they're likely to be inside of your network as opposed to crossing over from the public internet uh, in a remote location. So different things to consider in that environment. You also have people who are out in the field doing remote work, uh, maybe a sales force or technical services, people out, and they have different needs, different problems to solve, different device types perhaps. Uh, so being able to acknowledge how can they be productive, how can you configure their device so that they can get the most out of that but also ensure security. So that's another key piece of looking at that scenario. And then of course there's the remote worker, somebody who is not really in the field, they're, they're in a remote office, and ensuring again that they can have the best user experience as well. Now as far as device types, um, I'm going to start with the contractor device, so a device that is configured specifically for use while somebody is in your organization. When they're done, you can check that device in, reconfigure it, give it to the next person. So some different and more, <clears throat> and more frequent workflows with that kind of device. The other scenario is a shared device. So this would be uh, one where there's a workstation. Maybe you have people in your organization that are all sharing that device. One of the nice things about how we look at device compliance uh, that we'll talk about is how it is the pairing of the device to the user. And even on a shared device, you can do some pairing so that you're enforcing user level security on a device that might still be a shared device. Now the other thing to consider is sometimes these shared devices are not used by people in your organization because the type of organization that you are. An example would be a library or a lab. Uh, another example might be a hospital waiting room where you have these shared devices that are common and they have a very specific use oftentimes. Probably the easiest to think about is the one-to-one -one deployment where you have a person, you have a device, and whether you're actually tracking them together or not, you at least have that idea of this is the device that belongs to the individual, and you can configure it specifically for them based on what they're doing, who they are, and how they need to be productive. When you think about compliance, there's really three things I'd like to call out. One is if you can identify the device. Now, obviously, to track device trust and establish it at the device level, you need to be able to understand and track that, that device uniquely. The other consideration is, is that device managed? In the story that I was telling you about the, the device at the guest house, that's the kind of, of, of environment where this is not a managed device, or at least not managed by the organization to which you belong. When it is a managed device, you can have some assurance that you can configure that device to be secure, and you can take some of the remedia remediation actions. And that leads to the compliance piece of it. Not only is the device identified, managed, but is it compliant? And so we'll look at those as some of the workflows in what we did with Microsoft Intune and Jamf Pro. Now, when you get to that point, the question really is, what should you do about non-compliant devices? So let's take a look at some of the ways that Jamf addresses these scenarios. Again, I'm very quickly going to touch on the three areas of a trusted identity that I'm calling out today, the user, the network, and the device. Now, of course, on the user side, we can configure complex usernames and passwords and impose those at the device level, although ultimately they're tied to the user identity. The other thing that we do is integrate with single sign-on solutions. So this is just an example of using single sign-on for the Jamf Pro software itself, so that you, if you're using single sign-on, can use that credential as a way of authenticating and, and protecting who's logging into Jamf Pro. But more importantly, for all of the people in your organization who are using self-service, that portal where they can get more tailored information and be productive as an employee, we have single sign-on workflows for that as well. So this is a screen of single sign-on for our Mac self-service. And of course, once you log in, then you get that experience that's tailored to who you are and, and what your role is in your organization. And all of that can be placed under some user controls with single sign-on. Next, I do want to talk a little bit about the network, and I want to call out really specifically the kinds of device trust things that we can do at the network level. A really good example is Cisco Identity Services Engine, or Cisco ICE. With Cisco ICE, 
you can basically set up different groups within Jamf Pro, and based on how they're behaving, you can choose whether or not to allow somebody on the network. So it's leveraging the state of the device, and it's in enforcing it at the network level. So that's blocking network access. In this case, you can do that with an advanced search. You can set up multiple search criteria that define compliance. You can do that for computers and mobile devices, and then control who's going to be allowed on your network. So one example of how we address the network side of things, and this is just a, a closer screenshot of that, so you can see how you set up various searches for compliance, and you can provide some remediation messages. Now that all leads in to the main story that we have to tell, and that's our integration with Microsoft Intune and the device compliance, but at a software application level. This is where you get access to software applications and information, whether that's an application that is native on a macOS device or browser-based, and enforce that so only a trusted user on a compliant device can access that information. And that's really what we're doing now, as I mentioned on the Jamf Pro side, there's a number of things that we can configure to meet your security guidelines. That is to ensure that the device looks the way it should. It has the security controls. It has encryption enforced and those kinds of methods. But of course, it goes uh, deeper than that. So one of the scenarios that we'll look at is what happens, say, for example, you have an update to your passcode policy or your password policy, and you want to enforce a new standard within your organization. If you deploy that out, you'll have some people who are not compliant, and they will need to remediate that situation. So we'll take a look at that scenario. But I want to also show you just how this integration works and explain what Jamf is doing with Microsoft as it relates to the Intune integration. A few things to point out. One is that the Mac itself is still managed by Jamf. So this is not a dual enrollment in two management softwares. It is enrolled and managed by Jamf. Jamf is sending inventory data uh, over a specific API to Intune so that Intune then has the information it needs to do conditional access and remediation checks. And all of that access control happens on the Microsoft side with Intune compliance policies and the Azure AD environment. The other thing that we do, however, as uh, it relates to our integration is do some close coupling of tools so that we have a good user step to remediate. So you can see the status in Intune, but you can also remediate and do that, for example, through our self-service application. Now, the reason a lot of this is important, as I said before, is because data used to be all behind the firewall. We had devices that were often not mobile. They were within the firewall. They were located on premise. And so username and password and protection of information was a little bit different. But now that more things are available in the cloud, and can be logged into with your credential, it's not enough just to rely on username and password. That is one way of establishing user trust, but then you need additional factors, for example, to solidify and trust that user. And then you have to also be concerned about that device. Again, is that device going to be able to store and access information, and should it be trusted to do so? Because you know that you can actually wipe and remove that, that data on that device as well, should you need to increase security. Briefly, conditional access itself is really a method to control and protect what you need. So it's all geared toward protecting organizational data, giving your people an experience that allows them to do their best work, and do that from any device, but do so in a secure manner. Now again, because these are managed devices, when a device is managed, by and large, there isn't an intermediary step where you need to enforce compliance. The important thing is that you're able to when you need to, to protect that information. So what does this look like? The Microsoft Intune integration involves a MacBook, Jamf Pro, Intune, and the Azure environment. The first step really is that the device is managed by Jamf. So we are the management framework at Jamf with Jamf Pro. And as soon as that device is managed and the integration is set up, we can start passing information. The key part of this is a user step to pair the device with the user. We do this intentionally for the user to take this step because then you know in real time that it is this user and that user is trusted and they're on the device that they're registering so that now we have assurance that the pairing of the user and the device is intended, it is authorized by the user and initiated by the user. 
that allows us to do the pairing. And then when we're sharing that data with Intune, now we know when, when Intune needs to do a compliance check and enforce it through Azure AD, you understand the user is authenticated and is the device compliant or not. Now at this step where somebody's trying to access information, there's obviously two paths. One is that they're compliant and they have access to any organizational resources that they need. However, if they're not compliant, this is where we took an additional step and we imposed some user-friendly remediation, ways that they can get back into compliance and become productive again, but in a secure way. I want to dive a little bit deeper into the step where the user is registering the device. You might hear it called a workplace join. This is an end user interaction where they are acknowledging and authenticating themselves on the device that they're registering so that we can pair that device to the user. I do want to point out that although you can do a domain bind, the workplace join itself is not a domain bind. There are other ways to bind to Active Directory. So this step itself is not doing a domain bind. The other important thing to note is that this step is really geared toward registering the Mac, because we're talking about Macs in this case that are managed by Jamf, within the Azure AD and Intune environment. That creates the unique ID pairing the two together. And all of this is stored at a user level. This means that it is enforced on a user and device pairing. So a user can have multiple devices. That is, multiple devices tied to that single user. And you can have the same thing where you have a device with different users. So it has a lot of flexibility. The other thing that I wanted to note again is that we do leverage self-service as part of this because we, our goal is to use self-service as a place where the user can help themselves. I want to quickly point out some of the attributes that we're collecting. So on the machine side, some of the information that you would need to be productive are details like this that are coming straight off of what kind of device it is. I really want to emphasize the last bullet there, that this is useful for Intune generated reports, because yes, this is an integration that is geared toward providing information that allows you to ensure compliance and enforce conditional access. But this is also good for reporting purposes because now you can get a single pane of glass into those devices and report on those in a common place. The other information that we share is related to configuration attributes, things like disk encryption and password state. So there's a number of things that we share. If you go and look at the Intune integration with Jamf, uh, look up com conditional access with Intune and Jamf, you'll find a full list of the information that we're sharing across the two platforms. Now I do want to show you very quickly two of the scenarios. This first scenario is when somebody tries to access information, but they have not paired that device. So the device is managed, but the device is not understood in the ecosystem. It's not mapped to the user. So you can establish user trust, but you can't yet establish device trust because you don't know what device it is. In this case, we'll take a look at the user opening their email. They'd be prompted to log into their email account. And at this point, we're doing a compliance check. You'll see that this device is not fully enrolled. So they need to complete this step to enroll the device authenticate in to the Microsoft ecosystem. And now they can start doing that registration activity. So again, device is managed by Jamf. And at this point, they're able to start that registration workflow and pair that device to themselves. So we have different ways of doing this. In self-service, what we've done is leveraged a, a category where you can put a policy that initiates this workplace join activity, this registration. So when they kick off this registration, you'll see that we launch the company portal. This is going to help configure and, and load the user. And ultimately, this is preparing for that registration. So you'll see that in this workflow, the user had to log into self-service because self-service was put behind secure login credentials. So they log in to self-service. They log into the Microsoft ecosystem. That starts the registration activity. And then we wrap it up by confirming that with another authentication step. And at this point, they're fully joined. Now we understand not just that the device is managed, but we can map that device to the user and check for additional compliance criteria. So the thing we were checking here was, do we know who this device should belong to to start to impose conditional access? 
This next example is very similar, but in this case, the user has already authorized the device, registered it with Intune. It's managed by Jamf, and they're going to try to access resources. And this is the scenario that I mentioned before, where the password policy maybe has been updated, and this user has not yet updated to a more secure password. So they open Outlook, log in to check their email. We do a check at this point. You'll see that they get blocked. And at this point, they can click on a link to open the management portal of Microsoft to see exactly why they were not compliant. So they log in to check their compliance. And you'll see here that the password was too short. The password is too short, but we also provide them with a re remediation step. So you'll see that you can click on Resolve Issues. And that will open self-service and give them an opportunity to make sure that they have the proper password policy on the device. This is an area where you can place multiple policies. You can put easy fix buttons, for example, if you want the user to resubmit all the data on their device so they can make sure that everything is refreshed and updated. And you can provide additional information here. So just to recap a little bit here uh, before we get into the question and answer se session, Jamf Pro itself, a fully robust, able to, to secure the device in a number of ways. Again, geared toward mapping the end user experience to a very secure experience. We leverage our self-service application. We can be hosted in the cloud or on-premise. Uh, both are designed to work with our Microsoft Intune integration. So in either scenario, you should be able to, to use this. We integrate, of course, with the other Apple programs and services, so Apple School Manager if you're in education, the device enrollment program for that zero-touch deployment of unboxing and getting the device under management, and the volume purchase program for applications. I do want to call attention to some of our integrations. I mentioned Cisco and Cisco ICE as one type of integration. Uh, we do have an integration with Microsoft's SCCM product, Configuration Manager. The SCCM integration really is a data sharing integration to take all the information from Jamf and put that into SCCM. So if you are using SCCM, we do have that integration. The main difference between that and what we're doing with Intune is that on the Intune side, the information that we're sharing is being used in the ecosystem by Azure AD to enforce compliance. So it's how that data is being used is slightly different. It gives additional security in the case of what we're doing with Intune from a compliance standpoint. The other thing that I would note is that in the Intune workflows, we also have those links back to self-service to help the user. So we've coupled those together so that we have tools that can communicate. If you're curious about some of the integrations with Jamf Pro, please go to our marketplace, marketplace.jamf.com. You'll find a number of ways of extending the value of Jamf Pro through integrations that are available. And there's a few other areas that I'd like you to consider checking out if you're interested. So of course, if you have questions, reach out to us. If you're a new customer, let us know. Um, if you have a Jamf buddy or somebody in support that you typically work with and, and want to talk more, of course, reach out to them. Uh, but make sure that you do have that conversation with us if you need to. Somebody mentioned webinars and where this webinar is going to be posted. That will be on our Jamf.com website where we post a number of webinars. I would encourage you to look at what is there today. You may find that there are some webinars that we've done in the past that are of high interest to you. So please check those out. And we also have the largest Mac admin community present on Jamf Nation. And this is a really wonderful place to get engaged as an IT administrator with what's going on in Apple device management. You don't have to create an account and log in to participate. These discussions are public. Now, if you do want to post a discussion, you'll need to create an account. But you can still get a lot of value out of this just by reading through some of the things that people are talking about. I would really highly encourage you to participate and be a member of this community. Be a part of the conversation, because you'll be able to get more out of what's going on and be a part of that community. And I'm sure that many of you are already today. And for that, I would just say thank you. With that, we'll turn it over for questions and answers. 
Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Joe. Great information about uh, the new Intune integration here. Uh, so again, we have about uh, uh, 30 minutes left here for Q&A. Um, and uh, joining us uh, is Vlad from Microsoft, uh, which we really greatly appreciate uh, that he's here. And we've tried to answer some of the questions here uh, in the Q&A portion. But uh, let's try to summarize some of the things that have been that have been coming up here. Uh, one very popular item uh, has been uh, licensing, of course. And what are the requirements uh, for this to, 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 to have? So, of course, obviously you need to have Intune and Jamf Pro, but um, I wonder if you could just talk us through a little bit on uh, the licensing aspect. Yeah, absolutely. So on the Jamf Pro side, you really just need to be a Jamf Pro customer. Um, on the Microsoft side, you'll need an Azure AD Premium P1 license. That's the Azure AD license. And then an EMS E3 license or greater. Great. And Vladimir, do you want to uh, make any comments about um, licensing for Intune for our customers here? No, I think, uh, I think the answer was right. From our perspective, most of our customers have a PMS license, so Enterprise Mobility Plus Security. So as long as the customer has um, PMS E3 license, then they will be covered for this integration gem. That's great. That's great. Um, Okay, a couple other questions here uh, just around the binding process and around uh, management authority, uh, specifically uh, with um, uh, this workplace join aspect, a, a number of questions around workplace join. And um, can this be more in an automated fashion? Why is it built the way that we built it? Uh, if we could, uh, if you could address some of those questions, I think uh, that would help out a lot of folks. Sure. So um, a couple of things to note. So around the password and the login information that's being used here, the workflows that you saw, the user is logging in with the same username and password, but they're doing that in different applications. So some of that is enforced um, by Jamf in things like self-service, where we're using that same credential, but it's in the Jamf environment. And other things are the same username and password, but to log into Microsoft assets. And that's very important because one of the things that we do is we can leverage that credential, but if we wanted to streamline the process and cut down on login steps, for example, we would need to find a way to securely share that credential so that once it's logged in, we can store it and share it across applications that are sometimes residing in uh, the Jamf side or the Microsoft side. And so for the sake of security, one of the things we wanted to do was not overexpose those credentials. We are, however, focused on that end user experience and looking for ways to continue to streamline that so that they have the steps to be remediated, but we can try to make that user, that user experience better as we move forward. Now, the other thing that I would note um, on that, that same uh, initiative really is some of those tools that we're using have a very specific purpose. And so um, as far as automating steps, the actual registration activity, although we would look at automating it, um, if you automate it and you pre-assign a device to a user, then you're relying on that automation step as part of the process. And ultimately, when you allow the user to do it, you're putting it on the user to, to acknowledge what's happening with the device. So part of it is just user acknowledgement of I as a user am intentionally authorizing this device, associating it with me, and because you're doing it in real time, you have that authentication step to prove that the user is who, that they, are, who they are before you do the pairing. And also you get that step of not only am I authenticating to ensure that it's me doing the pairing, but I'm on the device at the time that I'm doing it. And so that just helps with the whole security of that flow. Now we are, like I said, looking at ways to streamline the experience, but that's some of the thinking around how we could do it and protect all that information. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, Vlad, do you have any other comments around uh, just the workplace join process at all? Uh, no, I think Joe is a word technically in that space, so I have nothing to add. <laughs> great, great. Um, lots of questions here about um, Azure AD um, and, uh, you know, asking, is that a requirement? Um, and, you know, uh, um, uh, how that links with Intune. Uh, Vlad, would you like to make some comments just around uh, Azure AD in general? Sure. So um, Azure AD is the central identity provider for many Microsoft Cloud services, including Office 365, um, and other cloud services like Intune and Azure Information Protection, 
So a lot of Microsoft Cloud services rely on, on Azure AD as that identity provider in the cloud. Um, and for that reason, because this integration um, is partially about securing access to Office 365, so Exchange Online, for example, you're keeping on the cloud, that cloud service relies on Azure AD. For that reason, um, the, the need for, to register with Azure AD uh, is here for so Mac devices, but as well as for other platforms that you know, Intune supports as well. Um, and again, Azure AD um, is very popular among many customers, especially around Microsoft. Um, and uh, it's not just conditional access that Azure AD provides, which will be covered here. Uh, things like single sign-on, user management, group management, uh, app delivery, and so on also can be done through Azure AD. So uh, just in general, at, at a high overview, um, from identity management perspective, in the past, a lot of enterprises used, used the on-premises Active Directory, um, where Microsoft is going now in long term is the Azure AD, which is quite a similar set of capabilities in the cloud, but it's really focused on the new use cases that are uh, enabled in this new world where you know devices and PCs and Macs are all uh, outside the comp company network, and the company data itself is not really just stored on premises anymore for many organizations, the company data is also stored in different clouds now, be that Microsoft or um, other companies in the cloud. So from that perspective, the way we look at it is that identity is that new perimeter, basically. That's how you can gate access to your company resources. So that's the, the shift that we have done at Microsoft years ago where we started using identity as that gateway versus using a network or a, a gateway that was used in the past um, for, you know, times where the company there was only stored on premises. Yeah, that, that's great, Vlad. Thank you for those those comments. Um, and uh, Joe, do you have other things to add to that? Yeah, I, I just want to, I think Vlad made a very good point in talking about Azure AD as the, the source of truth for the identity. Um, that's very important in what we're looking at. And when you think about how we designed this, we really designed it with uh, Azure AD as the compliance engine and the, ID, the identification source of truth in mind. So um, they, basically when we share data, we're sharing data so that it can all happen at the compliance check level, the way that Azure AD is built to ensure conditional access for identities and, and retain that source of truth. We didn't want to do any kind of you know, proxy workflows or other methods to do that. Um, that's what's really special about what we've been able to do here uh, with our Intune integration is preserve the way that it is happening and doing the compliance checks. That's great. That's great. Um, a, a number of also uh, other questions that have been coming up here is uh, that we have uh, this SCCM plugin, and um, we've had this SCCM plugin for a while now, uh, and we now have this Intune integration and kind of the differences between the two. Um, and also questions around, uh, you know, what is the relationship between SCCM uh, and Intune? Uh, Vlad, would you like to just make some comments quickly here on what Microsoft's vision is? for organizations uh, that are currently on SCCM and why they should move uh, to Intune. Uh, and then, Joe, maybe you can make some comments about uh, our SCCM plugin and this new integration as well. Sure. So um, from our perspective, um, SCCM has been in the market for about 25 years now, so the most popular tool for PC management, and it will probably be the most popular tool for the years to come. Um, however, again, as the world is, we see that the world is changing a bit, where again, the, the world is not just about the PCs anymore. You have now iOS, Android, Mac devices uh, being used by uh, different companies, as well as the fact that, again, the devices are not just on premises anymore, part of the company network. They also are basically everywhere in the internet. And for that reason, you know, the Intune and Azure AD and EMS are all were designed for that world, where, again, the devices are outside the company network and the data is stored outside the company network itself as well. So long term, as uh, more companies embrace this new uh, world of cloud services, cloud applications, and devices that are basically traveling outside the company network, EMS is a solution that Microsoft is focusing on from that perspective. But we also see a lot of interest from customers to continue using uh, SCCM or configuration manager to manage their PCs because it does provide the most advanced PC management abilities in the market at the moment. And if the customers would like to maintain that control, um, they can use um, SCCM for that. Uh, we also see customers that 
are trying to you know, unify their device management and use one tool to manage most of their devices and internet the tool for that. It's a cloud service that can be used to manage mobile devices as well as PCs as well. Um, so we see a trend where more customers are embracing this move to Intune, but at the same time, I also expect uh, SCM to be uh, the tool of choice for PC management for years to come. And we're continuing to invest uh, resources for SCM uh, with new features coming um, a few times a year. Um, and that trend will not uh, stop anytime soon. So that's the, a very quick overview of um, the relationship between SCM and Intune. Thank you, Vlad. And on the Jamf side, uh, we do have the the SCCM plugin. Uh, as I mentioned, it is really geared toward doing inventory data sharing. So um, you can set this up so that various uh, fields in Jamf Pro, extension attributes, and other fields uh, can all be shared with SCCM, and it it creates SCCM as another one of those single panes of glass, so to speak. So uh, you can get all that inventory data over into a common space and, and see that and run compliance. It's another another piece of uh, how you can do data sharing. We'll continue, uh, by the way, to maintain that SCCM plugin as an integration. There's nothing that would stop you from using both the SCCM plugin to get Jamf Pro data into SCCM and also leverage the Intune integration. The difference, as I mentioned before, is that with the Intune integration, that data is used specifically for the way that conditional asset, uh, access checks happen uh, when you're using uh, Azure AD as your source of truth for identity. So that's really the nuance there. If it's a if it's a need to enforce compliance and conditional access, the Intune integration is the core of what you'll need to get Jamf Pro managed Max there. Uh, but if it's a data sharing uh, method that you're looking for, you could use the Intune integration and or the SCCM integration. That's great. Thanks, Joe and Vlad. Um, the next topic that uh, I've seen a couple of questions here on uh, has to do with the remediation process. So we demoed uh, that remediation process taking place inside of self-service, and the specific demo we had was fixing a password. Mm -hmm. How are those customized? Are those templates? How does one go about building that inside of Jamf Pro and putting it into self-service? Um, very good question. These are uh, these are any any of the typical items that you see today in self service. So um, how can you use self service today? Um, these are not templated. Uh, we've talked about as we learn more about how people are using it, pre building some of those so that we have sort of recipes of how you can fix things. I'll give you an example at Jamf. We have an easy button. Um, I can go into self service and click the easy button, and it's going to do a few things, run some policies resubmit my my data, my inventory uh, of of the device, and basically help make sure that I at least have the the latest configurations on, on the device that I need. Um, so there's some examples of what what we can do there. and uh, but ultimately, um, these are typically policies that you can create. Um, for purposes of what we were showing, we created a category uh, called device compliance, and we put that into self-service. Um, you can use bookmarks to link out to those. Um, we also, you know, so those are just traditional Jamf Pro policies, and those policies can be scripts uh, that run. Um, and you can, you know, instead of uh, instead of like if you're going to remediate, you could auto remediate and set up smart groups. And if somebody falls into scope, you can automatically deploy the policy, run the script. Um, there's a lot of flexibility there, and we've encountered customers doing any number of things uh, in that area. But these are traditional self-service policies uh, that you would show there that would help the end user. Um, like I said, one of the common ones would just be to resubmit the inventory. But you can script out and put things there. Any normal policy that you'd want to deploy, you can put in self-service. Um, another way of looking at it would be you could leverage bookmarks in self-service um, and allow them to redirect to other websites and web pages to get information. Um, any, you know, it depends on your workflow in your organization and what you think the end user needs. Um, so there's different ways that you can handle that. We wanted to make sure that it was flexible enough that you'd have some options there. But uh, kind of to circle back to the idea of templates, we've talked about whether or not that would be something that we would look at doing to, to help in some of the standard areas. Uh, to, to be honest, the other thing to consider, um, you know, we can enforce the compliance. So uh, unless you're doing something like a new password policy or you have a device that's not registered already, 
generally speaking, it some of these things are kind of hard to fall out of compliance with. Um, not to say that it's not possible, but uh, for the, the typical user, if you're using uh, our software to manage it and it's already been registered with Intune and it's managed by Jamf, uh, generally speaking, they should fall under compliance most of the time um, and not, not require any remediation. That's great. Um, so a couple of other uh, uh, good topics that are coming up here uh, has, has to do with the Mac keychain um, and um, you know some issues uh, have been quite common in the past if you're binding a Mac to Active Directory there's some keychain issues uh, which a uh, great utility known as Apple Enterprise Connect uh, has helped solve us um, how do keychain issues uh, come into play with uh, this integration and um, instead using uh, Azure Active Directory as your uh, AD authority? So I think um, just one of the things to note, and we, we sort of mentioned before, in, in the scenario of the device being managed and enrolled um, and then registered into Intune, um, that specifically does not do any binding. So you would need to use something like an Enterprise Connect to do the binding. Um, the, the only other thing to consider really is just, um, you know, scenarios where the user's keychain might be, uh, you know, deleted. If you ever run into a scenario where the, the user's keychain is removed or deleted, um, in that case, because we're storing the pairing of the user to the device um, in that keychain, they would need to re-register, right? So there would be remediation steps should you run into that scenario. Um, but essentially, that's um, that's sort of the the ideal workflow in terms of how to deal with the user credentials and, and getting those uh, there. So just a consideration um, if you run into that, uh, any issues with Keychain, um, that's where you'd maybe just in terms of troubleshooting would be a place to look. Um, if somebody's having an issue, is their Keychain intact? Um, that would just be a consideration if you're going to troubleshoot anything. That's great. Um, this one uh, might be more directed to here uh, towards Vlad. So um, ask questions about uh, using uh, Intune in a hybrid uh, mode. So on-premise AD uh, and, and mastered accounts. Uh, Vlad, do you have any comments about um, you know, how this is supposed to, uh, you know, designed to be working with um, different version or different um, infrastructure setups of, of Intune and Azure AD? Um, so, uh, this integration is between um, Jam Pro and Intune Standalone, which is the cloud version of Intune. Um, to my knowledge, we don't have any plans to enable this for the hybrid configuration when Intune is connected with the System Service Integration Manager or ICCM. Um, so, and in general, we recommend our customers to uh, move from hybrid configuration to the cloud only version because it can deliver value and innovation at a faster pace with the cloud only version, especially since we migrated our service to the Azure platform now, um, so we can deliver features on a monthly, weekly basis now. So if you have currently um, Intune connected with SSCM, I would highly suggest to uh, switch that to Intune standalone. It's a relatively easy process now that does not require um, device re-enrollment for your mobile devices, for example, or, or Windows PCs. Um, and there are tools that can help with that as well. Um, so that would be my suggestion maybe uh, for that use case. When it comes to the identity piece, um, if you have um, AD uh, integrated with or synced with Azure AD, then that should work uh, just fine uh, from Microsoft uh, services side point of view. So your identity can be either pulled in the cloud, so only Azure Active Directory, or it can be in a hybrid mode where most of our customers are, where Azure AD is synchronized with the on premises Active Directory. That's great. Thanks for the clarification there, Vlad. Uh, we, we appreciate it. Um, Okay, let's hear. Got some other questions um, about so, you know, there, there's there's multiple ways to enforce a password policy now on the Mac in in this scenario. Uh, you know, what when we have all this set up, what would be the best way to just go about doing something simple like enforcing a password now on the Mac and ensuring that it changes after so many days? Sure. So um, on the Mac side, a configuration profile to enforce a secure and complex password, um, the, you know, the resetting of that password, all of that can be configured and provided down to the device. Um, we do have certain triggers that trigger that. Um, most recently, the change was that we could now trigger that on the login and logout historically. 
you would only be able to uh, enforce a change in password upon a restart. Um, so one of the things that you can do if you're going to, you know, push down a, a change would be to, you know, provide instructions or, or in, you know, enforce a restart type of activity for the user. Uh, but uh, that has changed with uh, with Apple op operating system updates, and so now when we deliver down a pass a new password policy, a configuration profile for the password, um, when we do that activity, it can actually be enforced um, now on the login login. Uh, uh, login logout activity as well. Um, and it's important that this is not like if the screensaver comes on and I log back in. This is the logout of the user and the login of the user as a trigger. Um, the, the explanation there behind that is when you have a new configuration profile, it's there on the device. Um, in addition to being able to put that configuration profile on the device, um, even though we know it's there, um, we still are able to validate whether or not the user is being uh, compliant with that. You know, we can force them to update it uh, upon the login, logout, or the restart, but just putting the policy and uh, the configuration profile in place is one step. It's that additional check that we're doing to enforce it um, that you see in some of those uh, examples that we showed today that allow you to more proactively update that so that the user can be compliant again. Now, of course, then there's other ways of doing um, how often you have to update it. Um, you know, I can say that I just got a, I got a message today that I have to go update my passwords. Um, so uh, you can work with us too on, on other ways of doing it, but there's some common workflows and very standard practice. That's great. Thanks, Joe. Um, so, you know, to take this back to sort of 10,000 uh, feet here, you know, this means uh, you know, if your end users are trying to access secure corporate resources that are, you know, uh, inside of Office 365 and their Mac, like say, isn't encrypted, they won't be able to access Office 365 data. And that's a really cool thing. Um, Vlad, I'm wondering if you can maybe comment around some of the common conditions that you see, um, you know, uh, PC customers applying uh, with conditional access uh, on PCs. And then maybe, Joe, you can comment around how we, you could translate some of those common uh, conditions uh, that is driving conditional access uh, on the Mac side of things. Sure. So um, I think from what I've seen so far, the conditions that customers usually check before allowing access to corporate resources are relatively common across different OS platforms. Um, and from our perspective, what we commonly see is ensuring the device is compliant. This is the stuff that we're doing with Jamf right now for Mac devices. And this can mean you know having a password, um, being having the device encrypted, uh, not jailbroken or looted, for example, you know, plus across operating systems. But the idea is that one of the things that a lot of customers really care about is making sure the device is compliant, is trust, it's not compromised. Um, so that's one of the main things. Another area is that a lot of our customers use conditional access um, with EMS is ensuring the user account is not compromised. This is where um, Azure AD does a lot of really cool work uh, using telemetry and data signals across you know, billions of data points we have through Microsoft Cloud Services to analyze user behavior, user machine learning, and to figure out if the user is potentially compromised or not based on more than 100 different um, uh, profiles that we have in the machine learning algorithms that have in the cloud. Um, things like location, for example, is the user coming or device coming from the right location, they trust it or not, um, as well as the applications. Are the user is using the right or trust applications to access um, Office 365 resources or not? So those are the common ones. I would say the device compliance um, and um, user security are the most common ones uh, that we see with conditional access because then you know that user is not compromised and then the device is not compromised. That's great. Joe, any uh, last thoughts here around uh, applying this uh, on the Mac? Well, I think, uh, I think Vlad covered off on some of the main criteria. And, and as I said, there's a number of things that on the Jamf side we can configure. So from a straight configuration standpoint, Things like um, like the CIS standards and benchmarks, um, those are things that you can accomplish. Um, you know, for the CIS specifically, we have extension attributes that allow you to collect additional information that is outside of sort of the basics of what we collect. And that's why I often refer to Jamf Pro as a platform uh, that gives you a lot of flexibility to add additional uh, attributes that you care about. On the uh, enforcement side, uh, a lot of that then can be enforced through Jamf, um, and so. 
you know, some things like SIP. Uh, SIP is one of those things that you can use as a compliance criteria. But if you were to try to, <laughs> if you're going to try to fall out of compliance with that, you have to know very specifically how to do that. So for the typical end user, um, they're not going to be able to to figure out how to do that. But there are some workflows like SIP that are such a manual process to fall out of compliance or find a a, a, a way of getting around it. Those are some of the ones that you know, we can't specifically remediate because it requires such a, a, a different workflow for the user. A lot of the other ones that we're enforcing, um, those are enforceable and they're, they're able to be remediated very easily. Like the SIP status is one of the few ones that I can think of because of the way you have to do a, a special boot process um, to, to modify that. Um, you really have to know what you're doing and have the right access to do that. Um, a lot of the things that we talked about here today uh, that Vlad just mentioned, I mean, encryption, Password complexity, um, you know, at the very basic level, if you just need a place to get started and roll it out slowly, just ensure that the device is managed is is already a first step in the right direction because that will allow you to only have the managed devices that you can already configure to be secure, known and allowed. Um, at that point, you can go into the additional checks. Um, of course, my recommendation would always be to preserve the end user experience and make it as secure as possible. Uh, because security is of such paramount importance. But if you're looking for ways of slowly rolling this out, there is some flexibility there to do that and make the right steps forward to gradually get your users into a good place. Great. Thanks, Joe. So we're just about uh, out of time here, but I uh, wanted to give a few minutes here uh, left uh, for, Bla uh, for Vlad. And again, thank you so much for uh, joining our webinar and uh, answering questions. Uh, Vlad, any final thoughts? And uh, also, where can uh, customers go to learn more about Microsoft EMS? Sure. First of all, it was a pleasure to join us. Uh, I want to thank you again for the invite. I had a great time today. Uh, if you're looking to learn more, um, just um, you can Google or Bing uh, Microsoft EMS and go to our product page. There's a lot of uh, good content to learn more about conditional access and what EMS can provide for you. Um, and we have lots of presentations uh, from our events and third party events. Um, and you can find YouTube, for example, if you just search for Intune or EMS, you'll find a lot of interesting presentations there as well, just to expand your horizon uh, about our products. Um, on that, I think that's all I have. So thanks again. Great. Thank you so much. Everyone, uh, we got to most of your questions today. If we weren't able to get to all of them, uh, some of our sales reps uh, will, of course, be reaching out to you. And, uh, but I highly recommend uh, check out uh, just jamf.com. Click on that little chat button down in the right-hand corner of our website, uh, and we would be happy to talk to you right away. So with that, again, thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day.